Well, welcome everyone. How are we doing today? Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you all as always. Um, you know, it's Max Schmarza podcast. So I don't need no intro. Who needs an intro? We just need a little quick sales pitch on whether or not you want to join the Always an Athlete team. Seven day free trial. When you sign up, give it a go. Check it out. It might be your cup of tea on a Train Heroic app. People are getting stacked, jacked, and more athletic. We've had some awesome feedback recently on the just power cycle, the strength cycle we just went through. Lots of PRs, bench press PRs, squat PRs. That could be you. That could be you. You might be missing out. Just because you're not on the team doesn't mean you can't join. Come on, feel free to join if you want to join. Uh, always an athlete team, seven-day free trial. With that in mind, by the way, I made a little tweet, a little tweet to the other day. That a lot of people liked. So I thought maybe I'll share it with you all here too, because maybe you all might just like what I'm saying. You feel me? Is about aging. We're always isn't that a weird concept, by the way? We're always aging. We are always getting older. There's no getting younger in this business. You just get older, closer to the old expiration date. All right. So um, a couple of things, by the way. I have on my Twitter, a couple of booming tweets. But one thing I pointed out that was interesting was, I don't don't know where this stemmed from, but we'll just go with it. The tweet itself said the lack of sprinting, jumping, and power-based training in people who are greater than 20 and still play recreationally is astounding. Why should you stop being athletic for the last 75% of your life? That's wild. Like, I feel like there's so many people who I see, who I meet, who I go out to cookouts with, or I'm at a barbecue. It's like, man, if you had a sprint, you might be in a pickle. Not like a physical shape thing. Like, oh, they're out of shape. They're not. Well, maybe they could be, but I don't know. I don't think they are. Um, Not pertain to that topic, but maybe they just don't run. They don't do an athletic. It's interesting. Like, I feel like running and sprinting jumping is such a natural thing to do and to let that just slide as you get older is a good way to feel older i watch guys like chris paul like 38 years old and hooping in the nba still that's crazy that's like mind but there's a lot of 38 year olds out there who, who probably can't run a mile they probably can't jump they probably are at a risk of injury if they were have to do 10 box jumps Chris Paul is out here hooping. Like, why do we give up on our, why is it such an assumed model? Oh, I can't run and jump. I'm, I'm no longer playing athletics. I'm just going to do some bicep curls. Yeah, you can do your bicep curls, but you can still run, jump and sprint. I wonder about that. I watched those old guys who run sprints. There's some dude who was booking it. He ran like a, I want to say it was a 14, 14 14.3 hundred meter sprint. I think that's right. Could be off, but could be 15 or four. I think it's 14. And he was like 70, 65. He looked great running it. He looked young. Like the movement looked young. Movement has an age. That's the thing I should coin. Movement has an age. Your movement can be young or old. There are young people who move old. It's probably not a good thing. When it comes to longevity, we love to talk about health markers, which are great. Absolutely. You know, but aging, it's more than just being alive. There's a functional quality to it, right? You have to be functional. You don't have to be, but I suppose you could have a functional metric to it. And you're functional. You have like a movement age. What is... Your ability to move, jump, cut, change direction, handle different aspects of movement. Now, I'm, I myself have gotten dinged up a couple times training. I do a lot of silly things with my athletes. I do too many things sometimes. I don't make the athletes do silly things. I do silly things because I'm training with my athletes way too much. I'll do like one of their workouts. Another guy comes in, I'll do their workouts. And my volume is way too high. Definitely wasn't eating enough. Whole different story topic we can talk about that later but moral of the story was look it's easy like i get a little ache or pain or something bother me and i totally give up i'm like man it came about because i was jumping and sprinting so i'm gonna stop no you just figure out work your way around 
I'm still able to run, jump, and sprint. I feel great. I'm not old, though. 29. Could be, could be famous last words. But just thinking about the idea of a movement age is a cool concept. And something maybe someone listening to this can capitalize on. Trying to identify your age. Like there's a chronological age, which is like literally how old you are. There's like a biological age and they do things like telomere length for measuring that or certain other specific biomarkers they might look at from a, a biological age. What's your movement age? What's your functional age? That's something we should really consider. That'd be a cool idea. Someone out there listening to this should uh, go ahead and do that. But I was just thinking about it. Man, you go to the gym, you don't see anyone sprint, jump, run, jog. You see some jogging. Sprinting, you know, gosh, you wanna you wanna have people look at you, you got like you got lobsters crawling out of your ears. Go ahead and do some plyometrics. Do an A skip in the weight room or warm up on a turf area in a public gym. They'll look like you're crazy. But what's really cool though was I actually went to a gym, in Miami. I was with AJ and we were out there. We had uh we we're doing the Remy workouts. Appreciate the hospitality of them. Thank you. And we went to a gym. It's like a U Fit gym. I think they still text me. Gosh, they, I shouldn't let you. They gave you like a free membership to text you once a day. I guess I don't know. We used it for like two days, and we were jumping on plyometric boxes. People were kind of looking at us, but one guy came over, and he was an older gentleman. And he goes, "Hey, you know what, guys? That inspires me." He goes, "It's really cool." He didn't know what sport we played, and he's like, "But just being able to move like that is something I wish I continued to do." And uh, it motivates me to stay in here and keep working because I think no matter what, how much money you got, no matter your background, being able to move is a, almost a form of, uh, a, in the way, if the way, if you were to describe intelligence as a currency, movement itself, I guess, could be a currency of sorts. It is a, a thing that you, maybe not an asset, it has value. Currency is like a means of exchange and you're not going to exchange, I guess your intelligence you could, but not necessarily your movement unless you're going to be playing a sport, but it could be an asset. It has value to you. Think about that. Being able to move is so important. Anyway, that's, that's not talked about. It's just not propagated. No one wants to discuss it. Means of progression and so on. And with that in mind, by the way, I think a lot of people get really confused when it comes to their power training. So I want to break down a power training day I had today with one of my athletes and how simple it is because I think people hear power training. Am I going to do this exercise, that exercise? What the million things you could do? I get it. The weight room is kind of confusing, but let me break this down for you. First and foremost, I like to do a lot of my power training paired up with exercises, especially in a combination method where it's short on time. Some days I'll just do a plyometric session and a heavy day, but let's say today I'm doing a combination session. I want to do some jumps and some power movements. I love to have my jumps paired with a power movement. Some sort of pairing. So, and here's the fun thing. The power movement, that loaded movement, has like no variability in it. Well, I'm not picking 95 different power movements. I'm just doing one. I might just do trap bar jumps, medium weight. And we're going to do that for eight to 12 sets, one to two reps. We're going to measure how fast it's moving. That is our anchor point. So that's our anchor, our anchor exercise. Eight to 12 sets, one to three reps. Then I have a variability exercise. That's the jumps. And with those jumps, we have a wide variability of options, a variety of options, I should say. So we might do a hurdle jump. We might do a lateral hurdle jump. We might do a one foot hurdle jump, but we offer up lots of variety for these movements. And the reason being is that the anchor point, that power movement, if I were to pick nine different power movements, I might not be getting the same stimulus. But I'm pretty confident if I'm doing some sort of plyometric, they are somewhat similar in nature to stimulate in, in the means of which they're being used. But also in training, you deal with training in sport, you deal with a wide variety of different plyometric like movements and plyometrics are used to translate to the sport and prepare you for the sport. And the lifting portion is more just a general aspect. So because of that, the lifting portion, I keep very stable and I keep the plyometric portion with a high variety. The lifting portion is there to train muscles. It is there to train explosive output of your leg and hip extensors, right? That's kind of the goal. The plyometrics are being used to keep it short and sweet for coordination 
coordinated explosive patterns as a whole. The ability to interact with the ground, be explosive after a ground contact, but under different conditions. So you have coordinated demands of movements. And in doing such, I'm able to get the loading of the power movements. And I'm able to get the exposure of plyometric movements. So on the surface, it's pretty simple. Just two exercises. And that was the whole workout. Well, two essentially exercises. I guess the power movement was the same. It were some variety of jump movements. So an example would be like this today. We did this. Let's just walk through it. Why not? Let's just do it. You're listening. Let's just do it together. We had trap bar jump followed by one to three jumps. The first couple sets were a pre-hop jump. Then we did one where we have like a horizontal jump into a, all these are over a hurdle for fun. You can do a box. You can do nothing. You can jump and touch something. Um, and then we did some single foot jumps. And then we did a lateral jump and then a one, two step jump all these different kinds of jumps that always came after the trap bar jump. So that's the setup. We rested enough and you rest about a minute and a half, a minute and a half. Let's just say two, two minutes. And let's say the actual jumping to lifting takes two minutes. That's basically 50 minute workout, right? So you're going to rest two minutes. The, the lift itself takes a minute. That's three times 12. It's 36 minutes. Good job. Bad math. If it took four minutes, it'd be, 48 minutes, which would be about 50. But you get the idea. It's a good chunk of time. And then after that, we went and did our upper body session. So that organization doesn't need to be so, so crazy. You don't need to do 95 different power exercises. I don't need to swap out seven different, a trap bar, a Bulgarian, a loaded power lunge. No, just pick an anchor exercise and work off of that. Then the area that deserves to have lots of variety can have lots of variety. I personally find that to be the most useful means of organizing my power sessions. I use this with athletes all the time, all the time. Absolutely love it. Simple with a dumbbell, easy peasy, lemon squeezy kind of deal. So I hope that makes sense. Um, the key variable to consider is just rest. Make sure you're resting enough. Don't rush your rest. Try and measure outputs, measure your bar velocity, jump over something because you want to be reducing your fatigue, increasing your competitiveness and acquiring a large enough volume to elicit a stimulus. Those are the three big things I consider with power training. If I can measure an output or jump over something, competitiveness, competitiveness and intent checked off. If I can um, have large number of sets and low number of reps, I am accumulating enough volume. If I rest enough and also use the large number of sets, low number of reps structure, I'm mitigating fatigue. I can cross check the mitigation of fatigue by looking at my power output on my measured devices. So all three of these have a little synergistic effect where they all work together. So by doing such, I'm now allowing for an optimal power training session. And honestly, we'll do this sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening, sometimes before a workout. We can modify the demand of this same workout, because we use this workout many different times, just by modifying the number of sets, because it's the volume that is where you're going to accumulate fatigue. Sometimes we've done 20 sets, sometimes just six, sometimes 12. It really depends. You can measure the feedback on the speed device, so you're measuring the device, or the feedback on how easy it feels to jump over something. Even your mental state of intent and readiness as a means to assess whether or not you need to cut off the training session. Because I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is not understanding how power training works, right? A lot of times when you think about lifting weights, you think about strain and gain, baby. Strain under the bar, gain muscle mass or strength. Easy, just like that. It is an effort-based thing that will tell you whether or not you've had enough efforts based on whether or not you can lift that bar anymore. But with power training, you can always jump. You're never so tired that you can't jump anymore. So how do I know when I've had enough load on the body for a stimulus? Well, research kind of tells us a little here and there. There's 5, 10, 15% velocity threshold drop off. So you can look at how far you're dropping off during your jumps as a possible means. But I think there are two really big things to consider. One, power training is a neurological phenomenon as much as it is a physiological phenomenon. The ability to activate your nervous system rapidly is going to then train those pathways to do such. So if you lose motivation or intent or engagement, that's enough. 
cut it off. That's one means of tracking it. Number two is to actually consider that velocity drop-off, which is a more quantifiable objective metric of load. And number three, I said to, I lied, I gave you a bonus one. Number three is making sure that your structure, that volume structure, sets and reps is going to allow for enough accumulated total volume. How do you know what's enough relative to what someone's done in the past? There is no magical volume number. I've seen people who benefit from just a handful of jumps and some people who need lots of jumps. Why? Because if you're just a beginner, you probably don't need as much. If you're later on in your career, you probably need a little bit more if you've been lifting quite a bit. So volume, like anything else, by the way, it seems that way, is relative to what you have been doing. Now, you can also induce possibly more demanding kind of power movements, like you might be uh, doing a quick load because you're increasing the stressor by increasing the eccentric velocity of that trap bar jump. Or maybe you'll take away the eccentric trap bar loading. You might just do it from pins and have a heavier weight. But again, you're a strength coach probably listening to this, and you already understand the idea of overload. And so as you progress further down the line and you start to see stagnation maybe in some of their power metrics, you might want to try a more intense means of overload. But I hope that makes sense. Hope you consider that. Um, because again, I like to move. I like to jump. I like to run and just not moving, jumping and running anymore just because we're getting older. Older is a relative term, by the way. It's something that's kind of odd. Uh, thinking about a movement age is something that could be a cool idea to consider. And what would you think about? What would be in your movement age? Would you add in mobility? Would you add in ability to change direction, sprint time, all this stuff? I think so often we bias toward mobility. Oh, can you touch your toes? Can you get in a squat position? Can you move your hips, ankle, shoulders, and neck? Yeah, that's fine. But can you also produce outputs? Can you run? Can you sprint? Can you change direction? That might be more associated with the movement age. Now, because we're talking about moving and grooving as we get older, we kind of wrapped it all together with some plow, some plow, plower, plyometric power training I mentioned. The structure I like, high number of sets, low number of reps, a la West Side Barbell and Louis Simmons. They had a great structure there with eight to 12 sets. But again, understanding that that set structure is because the reps are low, making sure we're motivated and have intent making sure that the structure mitigates fatigue and making sure the structure allows for enough volume to actually accumulate a stressor. Those are the kind of the big takeaways from thinking about how you're going to organize your power training. Um, so I hope that wraps that up there. And last little bit, by the way, got some fun news. I decided to put this at the end because some people might be listening to this and they just want the strength and conditioning stuff. And so if you guys are not listening to any more stuff about strength and conditioning, I'm going to talk about something cooler. NASA, I don't know what LR stands for, finds lunar pit, harbor comfortable temperatures. NASA funded scientists have discovered shaded locations within pits of the, on the moon that allow that always hover around, by the way, how difficult is it to read with the pressure on you of them being recorded? Big pressure. I'll start all over because I just butchered like half the sentences. NASA funded scientists have discovered shaded locations within pits on the moon that always hover around a comfortable 63 degrees Fahrenheit using data from NASA's Luna, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LRO, spacecraft and computing modeling. In other words, folks, we have the possibility, because by the way, I did not know this. The lunar surface gets so darn hot that it can boil water, but the shaded areas hover around 63 degrees. Possible place to set up a lunar base, one might say. Absolutely. My gosh, who doesn't need a little lunar news in their life? So we recently had an object crash into the moon left a weird double crater that double crater maybe they're trying to figure some things out what's going on in the moon maybe we're intentionally making craters so we can live in them mm, think about that it's a good idea 63 degrees fahrenheit sounds like a good temperature to hang out at a little chilly chillier than i keep my bedroom at you know probably more than 68 realm 63 is kind of cold sweatshirt weather though sweatshirt and sweatpants who doesn't like sweatshirt and sweatpants fall weather Get your, uh, get your, um, you know, your pumpkin spice lattes. Very exciting. A little beanie here and there. Sweats in the moon. 
So I figured I'd pass it on with you all. You can check it out. That was like NASA's website. Keep an eye on it for you all. Eye on the sky with Max. As always, appreciate y'all. Take care. And thanks for listening.